Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Welcome to the last session. Um, last year at Linux for you, I gave a talk called uh, The Future of Non-Volatile Memory. I was tempted to title this talk The Past of Non-Volatile Memory, um, but I thought further adventures might draw a slightly larger crowd. I didn't count on being up against Keith Packard. Oh, well. Um, so I've got two main topics I want to talk, about, talk to you about today. Um, I want to talk about NVM Express, and I want to talk about persistent memory. Um, these, these are basically the uh, two things I've been working on for the last year, and um, also, coincidentally, the uh, same two things I was working on the previous year. So if you go back and look at last year's, topics, last year's uh, presentation, you can see um, what I was talking about then, what I thought would happen, and uh, yeah, what didn't. <clears throat> um, so the NVM Express is now at revision 1.1a. Last year it was at 1.1. There are no new features in 1.1a. Um, the, the, uh, the, the letter revisions are simply collections of errata. Um, errata generally meaning, oh, that's how you interpret it. No, that's not what we meant. What we meant to say was this. Um, we are still working on features for NVM Express. Hang on a minute. I didn't explain what NVM Express is. I'm sorry, I was kind of assuming everyone had been to last year's talk. Um, NVM Express is a standard uh, that describes how um, PCI Express cards um, with storage on them can be talked to by the, uh, by the host operating system. So um, if, if, if you buy a PCI Express card with some memory on it, with any luck, it will talk the NVM Express protocol. Lots of vendors have come out with uh, their own proprietary ways of talking to, uh, talk, talking to storage. Um, some of them uh, emulate AHCI. Some of them uh, have their own proprietary interfaces. Uh, some of them emulate SCSI. Um, the problem is, last year I said, pretty sure some products are going to ship this year. Products are definitely going to ship this year, for sure. <laughs> Um, since last year, there's, there's actually been a plug fest at uh, the University of New Hampshire. The University of New Hampshire decided, uh, offered to the uh, NVM Express committee that uh, they could run interoperability testing in their interoperability lab. And so there, there, was, there was one test, uh, there was one uh, plug fest last year, and uh, there's going to be another one in February. So we actually have three drives. Three, three vendors have come up with drives that do meet this, um, that do pass the plug fast, but they're not for sale yet. I can only assume that these vendors are um, doing testing, uh, further testing. So, you know, the, the plug fast kind of tests some basic stuff, make sure things, you know, that, that it does obey the standard. I assume they're doing things like stress testing, uh, corner case testing, um, things that will make sure that um, when the drives go up, actually, go to actual customers that customers don't say, hang on a minute, when I do this thing, it, fall, it falls over. So, you know, I'm, I'm not too concerned that no drives are actually shipping yet. I, I think it really is just an abundance of caution that's causing uh, these companies to have not shipped a drive yet. But yeah, this year, this year for sure, you will be able to go to a shop and buy one of these cards. There, there, there are enough prototype cards out there. Um, I've got three different prototype cards at this point. Um, I've heard of three other prototype cars that exist and I don't have. So if anyone wants to talk to me about sending me a prototype card, I don't work for the part of Intel that makes, um, that, that, that makes uh, drives. I work for the part of Intel, uh, you can see in the corner, software and services. I write software. I'm in the open source technology center. If we need to set up some kind of Chinese wall so that I don't talk to them about what kind of drive performance I'm getting with your card, very happy to do that kind of thing. That's, that's OK. So what, what, what have we done in the driver since last year? Um, I'm, I'm actually kind of embarrassed. I, I went back and looked at uh, the change log, like what, what, what changes got committed um, since last January, uh, I, last time I talked to you, this, this, this group of people. I'm embarrassed that discard wasn't in already at that point. Um, di discard, of course, is, is the way that um, the uh, file system can tell the drive, hey, I'm not using this range of blocks anymore. You don't have to take account of that when you're going to do wear leveling. I, I don't know why this feature wasn't in, but it wasn't. Um, we've fixed 
dozens of bugs. Most of the commits have been bug fixes. Um, mostly, you know, corner case kind of stuff, things that didn't show up in my initial testing. Um, people are doing more stringent testing now, and that's really good. And they're sending me patches, and I'm integrating them. Um, a great new feature is SCSI emulation. So uh, there, there are some applications out there that uh, send raw SCSI commands down to hard drives, and they kind of expect them to work. Um, they do work for um, serial ATA cards. There's something called um, SAT, the SCSI to ATA translator, that uh, does the translation between a SCSI command and an ATA command and sends it down to the hard drive. Well, we've got, we've got very much the same thing. Uh, we've now got two implementations of SCSI to foo um, conversions in the kernel. And so the third person who comes up with a SCSI to something translation is going to have to make it all generic, because right now they share absolutely no code at all. Um, we've added a character device, so you can, you, you, can talk, you can now talk to a device that doesn't have any um, partitions, any namespaces attached to it. So that, uh, just kind of a control, hey, um, execute this command, like maybe you need to up, up, update the drive firmware. Well, you can do that without actually having to talk to a particular partition of the device. You can just talk to the entire device. You can't do I.O. to it, but you can um, send, uh, send uh, control commands. Um, we've added partition statistics. This is something we would have got straight out of the block layer if we were using more of the block layer, but we bypassed most of it, so we have to roll this kind of stuff ourselves. We have support for metadata. If, um, for example, this is uh, like T10 uh, diff or dix information. If you uh, want to send uh, CRCs for every sector, we now support that. That's awesome. Um, we support uh, multiple MSI messages. So um, if, if when, when you're getting an interrupt, we already supported MSIX. Um, one of the vendors decided they didn't want to implement MSIX. They wanted to implement multiple MSIs instead. Um, this is a poor decision on their part, but um, it is cheaper. I do understand why they did it. I told them, I explained to them my reasons. They explained to me their reasons. We agreed to disagree, and I took their patch. Uh, we've actually got some nice little speed ups in, um, mostly around corner cases. There's, there's not really been a whole lot of um, speed ups in terms of like regular IOs, but um, things like, oh, the drive has gone bad and we need to tear down all the queues now happens much, much faster. Um, we can do suspend and resume now. Um, originally, this wasn't a very high priority because um, th this is really targeted at servers, right? Uh, how, how many PCI Express cards really get plugged into laptops or other things that get suspended and resumed. But it turns out people actually do want to suspend and resume servers after all, so we add a support for it. Hot plug, again, very major important feature. Um, people like to be able to hot add and insert um, NVMe Express cards, and we now support that. One I just added recently, more partitions. When, when, when I created the driver, I said, ah, 60, 64 partitions per namespace, that will be fine. Nobody will need that. And then I talked to our, and then, and then our database team got hold of a sample. And they said, how many, how many partitions does it support? And I said, oh, I, I think quite a lot, maybe 256. And they said, well, after you create 64, it, do, it stops working. I thought, oh, right, oh yeah. I went back to look at the code. Yeah, 64, that wasn't enough for them. They needed more partitions than that. Databases. I've had contributions from dozens, dozens of people. None from any Australians. If you want to be the first Australian to contribute a patch to my driver, I'd be delighted. Um, I particularly want to point out um, Keith from Intel, uh, Keith Bush. He's, he's been an absolute star. He has contributed by far the majority of patches uh, since last January. He has, I think, contributed more than I have. He is wonderful, and I just want to publicly thank him. But um, it's, it's interesting to see where some of the people uh, come from who are making contributions. Um, there's very little overlap between the people who have successfully passed the drive testing and the people who are making contributions to the driver. So I think there's a lot of people out there who are perhaps in stealth mode at this point about you know, whether they're working on a driver or not. There's, I'm getting a lot of patches from Gmail, but I can figure out who they are. <laughs> 
Um, so th th there's there's still work in progress um, on the driver front. On the driver front, um, we're fixing bugs. Uh, there's uh, there's a new f there, no, there's, there is an existing feature in the spec we're not taking advantage of at the moment, which is where you can tell the drive to go into a lower power state. You can say, I don't really want you to run at 20 watts. I want you to run at 15 watts instead. I'm I'm willing to accept the uh, lower performance. Um, Go ahead and and and, and uh, save me some power. Um, there's a guy who is working on scatter gather list support. So this is a new feature in 1.1. It wasn't in 1.0. Um, it, it it's it's a more flexible way for the host to specify the this these are the memory addresses I want you to write to. Uh, it is more flexible. It's also less efficient. So um, I've, I'm 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 iterating with this guy on making sure it only gets used in cases where it's a clear advantage. Um, I've had patches to support block multi queue. This is this is a um, this is a new feature in three point thirteen, um, where uh, so the NVM Express driver plugs into the block layer at a very high level in the stack. Um, it, it takes a BIO pretty much as soon as it's been created and sends it down to the drive. Um, there are people who feel, and uh, some of them are in the audience, that uh, we, we, we should allow things like um, merging of BIOs that are going, if, if, if uh, you get three requests to consecutive sectors, that those three should be merged uh, rather than uh, being sent out as three separate commands. Um, having seen some performance numbers, I'm a little bit more inclined to agree with them than uh, I once was. Uh, Linux has some interesting I.O. patterns on occasion. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're negotiating uh, how that one's going to get accepted, and I'll talk a bit more about that one later. Um, there are some bugs in how, in how the SCSI layer, hand, well, sorry, not the SCSI layer, in how the block layer handles um, the, the, uh, the, the Dix metadata that I was talking about earlier. And uh, my colleague Keith has been frantically submitting patches and um, they're being ignored at the moment. So um, next, time I, next time I see Martin Peterson, I'm going to smack him a little bit. Um, and we are working on various latency improvements and that's what I want to talk about next. So handling an interrupt costs two and a half microseconds. That doesn't sound like a whole lot. I mean, you know, you, you can still, <laughs> you can't get a whole lot done in two and a half microseconds. It's maybe execute seven and a half thousand um, instructions. Yeah, that's, it's not nothing, but you know, two and a half microseconds isn't that much. But when you start to talk about, oh, I've got a million IOP device and I'm, I've put it on a machine with 4,096 CPUs, then two and a half of those CPUs are being used to do nothing but service interrupts. And uh, you can see a customer say, do I, do, I, do I really need to spend two and a half CPUs just to service interrupts? Well, no, we, 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 have, we have a couple of different options available to us to improve that. Uh, one, one is that uh, we can do, use interrupt mitigation. This is built into the spec, has been since uh, before 1.0 was released. Um, there, there's, the, there's, there's a timer on the drive, and if the, it, it, you, you, you can configure the timer to only let an interrupt out of the device after a certain number of microseconds have expired. So, you know, that's kind of cool. And, and it, it's, it's also got a, um, it's got a get out where uh, if, you, know, you, you can also configure the threshold for how many IOs have completed. And so if 100 of them complete, it will also fire off an interrupt because clearly the, uh, the, 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 the host isn't keeping up to its end of the bargain on uh, scanning the queue uh, frequently enough, scanning the completion queue frequently enough. Um, but um, a more interesting thing is something that a bunch of my colleagues, uh, a few of my colleagues worked on, uh, Jizu Yang in particular, um, submitted a paper to, I, I believe it was FAST a couple of years ago, where he talked about doing synchronous, uh, synchronous IOs. And what, what, what he did was, um, is usually when one submits an IO to a, a, a block device, one um, sends it down, makes a note, you know, allocates a data structure, so keep track of the IO, sends the request down, 
waits for it to come back, the interrupt triggers, and it does a completion. Well, what, what he did instead was just for, for we had a pro, we have a prototype device around called Chatham that basically does I/O directly to DRAM. So the completions come back very quickly. I I, I think maybe um, a microsecond or two. So it will, it will by the time you've 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 scheduled away, handled an interrupt, come back, the, the I/O has actually been done for like four microseconds at that point. So what he did instead of sleeping. He would spin, so he'd submit an I/O, and then he would just look at the completion queue and say, "Has it finished yet? Has it finished yet? Has it finished yet? Has it finished yet?" And once it had, he'd return, and he got some great latency improvements. Um, I think it was like eight microseconds down to five and a half microseconds. So hey, you know that that's really good. Except of course you're spinning the CPU, burning power for five and a half microseconds, and I can see Paul McKenney's eyebrows twitching. <laughs> Um, I improved on that slightly um, in that, uh, so he, he, he would just do one I.O. at a time, and that's going to limit you somewhat, right, because, um, you know, it, it, you, 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 you basically can't do more I.O.s than the product of the, sorry, the reciprocal of um, the, 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 the latency of the device, right, so... If, if, if you take 10 microseconds to complete an I.O., you can't possibly do more than 100,000 I.O.s per second. So what, what I did instead was um, I changed, I, 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 I left the I.O. being submitted asynchronously. But at the point where we would choose to sleep, waiting for the I.O. to complete, I instead started spinning. So that lets us queue up a whole bunch of I.O.s and then when we were going to sleep anyway, choose whether to sleep or to spin. And this, this was implemented as a callback into the device driver, so the device driver itself could choose, you know, could, could, could look at the state of the queues, you know, is there a lot of I.O. already queued up, or you're probably going to have to sleep anyway, so just go ahead and start sleeping now rather than uh, spinning. Or the device driver could say, well, I'll spin for a microsecond, and then I'll go to sleep. You know, to kind of limit the, uh, the amount of time spinning. So I sent a preliminary patch out, and it got some pretty good feedback. Um, that was June. <laughs> and I need to address some of that feedback and submit a new version of the patch. But um, we, we, we haven't seen any uh, real, well, we haven't seen any NVM Express devices yet, so I'm not feeling a whole bunch of pressure to make the you know, second or third generation of them uh, perform at their absolute best. So that, that's, that's speeding up the completion side. Can we do anything to speed up the submission? Well, we're already doing a pretty good job of speeding up the submission compared to SCSI or ATA. Um, the, these are the uh, data structures that get used to um, describe an I.O. during its journey from the file system all the way down to the hardware. Um, you, you know, you, you've got a page in the page cache that describes, hey, this is the memory we're going to be, uh, let's say, writing. Uh, you've got a buffer head that describes the sectors we're going to be writing to. You've got to then, then those get combined into a struct BIO that describes this is the memory and these are the sectors we're going to be writing to. On, in the SCSI driver case, we then bundle a whole bunch of BIOs together into a struct request, and then we transform a struct request into a struct SCSI command, and then we send the SCSI command down to a driver, and the driver creates its own data structure to describe the command and sends it off to the hardware. Well, in NVM Express, as I said earlier, it, it, it hooks in a fairly high level in the, uh, the stack, and so we translate the BIO directly into a, uh, into a driver-specific data structure and sends it off to the device. So that's pretty cool. We've, we've, we've chopped out a couple of layers of abstraction here. But we can do better. And I wrote this, this code on the plane on the way here. And it worked. I've actually been working on this for um, a couple of years now with, uh, with, with the help of my colleague, Keith. Um, we resurrected it recently. and. Uh, we, we, we were kind of playing with it and pa sending patches back and forward. It's like, yeah, you know, it's good, but it's not quite right. And on the plane on the way here, I had an epiphany, and it all got so much simpler. But 
I've done away with a driver-specific data structure. I've done away with the BIO. Like, what, what, what is this black magic I have done here? Well, it's a, it's a new concept I call page IOs. Um, so I added a read-write page function pointer to the block, the block driver operations. So at the point where uh, the, the code would, would normally start to construct a BIO, it says, hey, is there just one page here? Am I, am I going to put this one page into a BIO and send it down? And if it, and if it is, it says, well, I can skip that. I know how to read or write a page. I just call uh, BDEV read page or BDEV write page. And actually, I think the more important one, because I, I added this to mpage.c, so it works for um, DD and so on. But I think the more important place I've added it is the swap code. And that's because um, the swap code, um, normally, we, we, when we think about swap, it's a bad thing, right? You, you, you generally don't want to swap out stuff that's in use. OK, that's true. But part of the reason swap has such a bad reputation is that swap devices are actually pretty damn slow. Right? So you, you, you're, you're trying to avoid the, um, you're, you're, you're trying to avoid this slow thing. But if you speed up the slow thing, perhaps you don't need to avoid it quite so much anymore. I mean, um, a lot of these devices are pretty fast. Um, you know, if, if, <laughs> I was just talking about you know, a device that can complete in a microsecond or two. OK, it's, it's a fake device, but you know, maybe we'll have some real hardware in the future that can do that kind of thing. I mean, an enterprising person could today go out and build themselves a, a, a device. Um, there was a PCI device um, like 10, 15 years ago that had a whole like, had gigabytes of RAM on it. And Texas memory systems, I'm being told, built such a device. Somebody could build such a thing, and if it spoke NVM Express or indeed any other thing, and it, the uh, device driver implemented this read write page, it could be very, very quick. So, does OpenStar support multiple pages in a single bio? I'm being asked whether this supports mul this, 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 IO, this thing supports uh, multiple pages in a single BIO. It does not. Um, <laughs> I'm being informed that it needs to. <laughs> So the, 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 the idea here was to avoid doing any memory allocation at all. So for each page, it would do a separate um, I.O. And that seemed like a, it, it, it's going to very heavily depend on the device, whether that's actually a good trade off or not. Um, I, I, I think there's a whole bunch of, of tuning and investigation work needed here. Um, The XFS author is informing me that <laughs> certain file systems um, create BIOS containing multiple pages and uh, cannot. So what, what I do is, in, in, in the M page code, um, at the point where you're going to add a page to a BIO, and, the B, and there currently isn't a BIO, it will just send that page down instead. So where the file system would have created a BIO with multiple pages, it will send down those multiple pages one at a time. Um, now, if, if, if a BIO is being constructed somewhere else, that, that, that's fine. I mean, it's just going to go down the normal BIO path. Or if there's anything special in any way, like it's, it's, it's less than a page or it, it, it ends early, like, there's, there's all kinds of get out clauses that just say, yeah, just, just go back to the regular BIO path and, and, and don't worry about this special thing. It, it, it really, to me, this was all about swap. And the fact that I could do it at all in the end page code was just a bonus. So this is all it takes for the RAM driver. I, I, I was so impressed. It's like 10 lines, and I could get it all on a slide. And I think it's even a reasonably viewable. Paul, do you, do you agree? Is that, is that actually viewable? For... Yeah? OK. okay. Big, big enough. OK, great. So yeah, there's, there's... Great. <laughs> yeah, so I, I was actually pretty lucky here. Like, the... Um, this uh, BRD do BVEC, that was an existing, that's an existing function inside the, the RAMDIS driver. Uh, it says basically, 
Uh, basically, that's mem copy. It's, it's very little more than just, hey, you should do this mem copy. Uh, page end IO, that is a new function that I, that I cut out of the middle of mpage.c. Every single line of code in, in uh, page end IO already exists in mpage.c. I just faxed it out into a new function. Um, and everything else is just BRD stuff. You know, it's, it's, it's boilerplate. I mean, really, there, there's, there's two lines of code here. <laughs> it's call this function that already exists, and then call this function that will exist after my other patches. Um, NVMe got a whole lot more complicated. Um, I, I had to do a whole bunch of different changes to it, and it ends up being hundreds of lines because I'm touching a whole bunch of different stuff. I'm changing prototypes, and when you change a prototype, the whole driver got changed. But I think this is really important. We can do a swap I.O. without allocating any memory. <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's, it's always been crazy to me. Yeah. Oh, in order to write out this page to free up some memory, we need to allocate some more memory. No. No. Just create a way to get rid of pages out of the page cache. Like, write them back and be done with them. And, and, and this lets us do it. And this just makes me inordinately happy. Then I went to uh, Rusty's talk, um, and he was talking about the Vert.io block driver. I was like, why didn't I think of doing a fix of hacking that? So it's, it's not quite as good as NVMe, and it's not quite as good as BRD. I mean, you know, it's, it's a, what, 41-line patch. Um, it does a couple of nasty tricks to uh, uh, squash some stuff into places it doesn't belong. Um, it still does a memory allocation. It, it, it is a bit of a hack, and I know Rusty's going to absolutely hate me when I submit the patch, but I'll, I'll, I'll submit it anyway. <laughs> it, it, it's a nice job. I mean, that's not a huge patch, right? 41 lines, 41 additional lines. Yeah, that's, it's, it's not like, I, I, don't, I don't even know if it is, seriously, I don't think it's going to be a performance improvement. I, I, I just did it to show um, that it could be done. It could be done without being nearly as invasive as the NVMe driver. The, the changes I did to the NVMe driver were really invasive to the driver, but it, it, I, I felt it was such a huge win to be able to do an I.O. without allocating memory that I really wanted to do it. Um, and the approach I took with Vert.io block was I want to show what the minimal change is that I can do to a real driver and still have it work. Um, I, 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 I don't think it's actually a good idea to do that to the Vert.io block driver, but I wanted to explore that possibility. So that's all the cool stuff I've been doing on what we might call standard um, block-based stuff. So now I'm going to talk about persistent memory, which is the other half of my job. Um, unlike NVM Express, <laughs> you can actually buy NVDIMs today. They're not cheap. Um, a colleague likes to describe them as being for boutique uses. If, <laughs> if, if, if you have special uses and you know what you're doing and you're willing to write an awful lot of code, you can change your application or, or, or your kernel to, and probably both, to let you do things. So the, these NVDIMs um, are generally finding their applicability at the moment in um, caching applications. So uh, you, know, you, you, you might well find, find them plugged into um, high-end storage arrays, for example. And often, um, often <laughs> they're DRAM. Uh, with a great big capacitor on them in case the power goes out. Or the DRAM acting as a tiny cache in front of a whole bunch of flash memory. Or the, a chunk of DRAM, a smaller capacitor, and uh, a bunch of NAND. And on power failure, it will write back everything that's in the DRAM to the NAND. There's, there's, there's lots of different ways that people are making NVDIMs today. Um, looking into the future, which is what I did last year so successfully, um, we, the, there's four or five different technologies being pursued by three or four different companies because some companies are, are pursuing different avenues all at the same time um, that look to be likely to produce um, something that is, has the kind of density of flash but the speed of DRAM. At least that's what they're all promising. Every single one of them is promising this. 
and um, I, I can only assume that one of them will eventually succeed. And um, when they do succeed, um, I want Linux to be ready to support them, whenever that's going to be. Um, but in the meantime, we can test with NVDIMs, and that's really cool. We've actually gone out and bought some. You can go out and buy some too if you've got the cash. Um, so the characteristics that we want to talk about here for persistent memory is it's byte addressable, um, and really that means cache line addressable, because that's what the CPU, the CPU doesn't go off and fetch a single byte, it goes off and fetches a whole cache line, so maybe 64 bytes, 128 bytes, that kind of thing. Um, and we want it to be able to sustain CPU reads and writes at full speed. You know, we don't want this to be slowing down the CPU at all. The CPU architects get very angry if you suggest to them that maybe the CPU might have to stall on this stuff that's almost memory. And it's always accessible. There's some people who are creating uh, NVDIMs that are kind of paged. You, you have to you know, write a special value over here, and then you get access to this much of it, and then you write a different value, and you get access to this bit over here. Uh, we don't support that kind of thing. That's, that, that's not interesting to us. Well, it's interesting, but it's not... Uh, readily supportable through this uh, interface. Um, so Intel Labs gave us this file system called PMFS, and it's really pretty cool. It does all kinds of really interesting stuff around um, uh, modifying stuff in place, and it's got its own journal, and it, it, it knows that you know, cache lines are this big, and it, it, when it's going to modify the file system metadata, it goes and, and, and it copies bits here and copies bits there, and it's all really pretty cool stuff. But um, the problem is that they're, 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 very, they're, they're very clever people. They know an awful lot about the CPU, and they know nothing at all about Linux. Um, they would do things like take an RCU read lock and then take a mutex. <laughs> Paul McKenney is shaking his fist, let the record show. <laughs> Has anybody suggested they run locked up? Um, these are labs people. They don't really care about whether it's usable in the real world. They're, they're, they're very much interested in um, promoting their research interest and then moving on to the next project. In fact, they've already moved on to the next project, and they, ha and they threw it over the wall to us. <laughs> Paul's suggesting we could replace all the mutexes with RCU. And I, I, I'm, SRCU, right? Yes. No, we're not, we're not doing that. We, 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 we decided to um, reluctantly abandon this, this, this special PMFS um, because it, 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 it was very, very clever. Um, and I'm sure for some workloads, or probably even a lot of workloads, it would be faster than a standard file system. But in terms of an application workload, um, it doesn't matter. What, we're, what, we, what we think are the interesting workloads for persistent memory are people who have uh, in-memory databases. Oh, look, all of a sudden, doing I.O. to this in-memory database is really, really fast. So um, we, we decided to look at standard file systems like ext2. Oh, it's already got this XIP option. And this was contributed by some guys from IBM um, back in 2005. And their, their use was um, S390 with lots of virtual machines. And they wanted to share all this memory. So they had a special block device that exposed host memory. And um, yeah, it, it, it let them uh, it, it achieve their goals. So great. On the other hand, ext2, kind of old. Um, doesn't support a whole bunch of uh, modern file system features. Let's port it to ext4. And then Dave Chin reviewed our patch. And then Dave and I started arguing. And because there were so many bugs in the ext2 code, we started talking past each other. So I thought he was talking about this bug that I'd spotted, but he was actually talking about this other bug that he'd spotted, and he hadn't spotted the bug I'd spotted, or vice versa. So <laughs> this, this is the one that I spotted. It's actually kind of complicated. Um, and I don't have a whole lot of time left, so I'm not going to go through it in any, in any detail. But um, I had to add an extra mutex. And, and that was actually fairly straightforward. The one that Dave spotted is much easier to explain, which is that they didn't have any locking on the read path, which meant if you truncated while you were doing a read, 
you were reading somebody else's memory all of a sudden. Don't. So, um, unfortunately, Dave's while easier to explain was slightly harder to fix in that I ended up rewriting um, all of the things. Um, <laughs> literally, the, the, it started out as being 900 lines of code. It finished up being 900 lines of code. Not one of them is the same. <laughs> uh, Paul McKinney talks about... That, uh, yeah, there's, there, there's a curly bracket, yeah, yeah, you're right, yeah. Um, but um, the, the nice thing was that it added support for AIO. They didn't have support for AIO in the, uh, the original code, so that was, that was kind of cool. <coughs> we also restructured the, uh, the code. So before, the XIP code would be called, and then it would call into the file system and say, hey, I need these pages, and the file system would then call the device driver and say, oh, what, are, what, 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 what's the address for this page? And like Dave said, that, that was stupid and wrong and evil and a layering violation and so on. So we don't do that anymore. Instead, the, uh, the file system gets control really early and says to the XIP code, here's how you ask me about blocks. And it's the same get block interface that gets used for everything else in the VFS. So that's nice, less code to write. Um, and the XIP code will then call the file system and say, what blocks is that? And then the XIP code calls the block driver and says, what addresses are those? Rather than trying to thread all this through the file system, it calls the file system and then it calls the drive device driver. Much simpler. One, we believe, since these people are talking about um, creating uh, uh, technologies that have the kind of density of Flash, that we're going to get huge quantities of this stuff. I mean, if you if you, if if you're you know your your flash drive today, you have to buy a flash hard drive. I mean, look at the capacities, right? 160 gig, 200 gig, 800 gig. We're kind of anticipating that you're going to be getting terabytes of this stuff. Um, and if you have a terabyte of this stuff, you probably don't want to be mapping it in 4K pages because your CPU is just going to be thrashing its TLB. So uh, one of the uh, patches I sent out adds support for um, faulting on uh, two megabyte pages. And it reuses a whole chunk of the transparent huge page um, infrastructure, which um, actually worked out really nicely. And uh, then we added uh, support for, well, I've got, a, I've got a tentative patch in the work to do the same thing for one gigabyte pages. It's, um, it's pretty tentative. I haven't done any testing this at all. I, I didn't think it was going to be possible. And then somebody showed me, oh, no, go on, give it a try. And so I did. And it, <laughs> it was only like 100 lines of code. So it probably doesn't work. But it, 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 look, it looks like it could work. Uh, but what, one of our challenges with this is that we're going to need uh, file system block allocators to understand that all of a sudden they're going to need to do aligned contiguous blocks, because if you're putting in a two megabyte TLB entry, what you're pointing at, the memory you're pointing at, also has to be aligned. And uh, certain file systems already have this, and other certain file systems don't. So, you know, that's going to be a challenge for some people, and it's going to be adding one bit to somebody else's files, somebody else's uh, file system. So, that will be cool. There's a whole bunch of stuff, but what I really wanted your help with was we really need a better name than XIP, because this really isn't about execute in place. It's about I don't have a page cache, um, or I'm bypassing the page cache. Whereas, because it, it, it's not just about executing in place, it, it's, it's mapping in place, it's doing all kinds of things. But XIP is kind of a cool acronym. I, I really like the XIP acronym. But Linux actually uses XIP two different ways right now. Um, if, if you go grepping for XIP in the kernel source, you'll find that the, uh, the MTD code uses it to talk about uh, map, um, executing the kernel out of Flash, out of NAND or NOR, and um, we're using it to talk about putting uh, bin uh, user space binaries, um, executing user space binaries out of, uh, out of our Flash or Flash equivalent. Um, so I'd really like to have a better name if anyone uh, can come up with it. There's a parallel to direct, to direct and buffer I.O. So it's almost a direct execute, really. Yeah, the, 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 the suggestion was this is really direct execute. It's very parallel to uh, O-direct. 
Um, so direct execute. Uh, that's, that's, I quite like that one, actually. Any other suggestions? So you can send me email. I, I'm, I'm willing to take suggestions for, for a while. But um, basically, because we've rewritten the entire file, this is the perfect time to give the file a new name. Um, so, you know, uh, soon. Send me, send me email soon. Any, uh, any more questions? OK. Um, oh. uh, what about the capacity, capacity of uh, this RAM, new RAM size? Uh, what about the capacity? Well, they don't. Is the capacity in, in, is it comparable to SSD? So is it well, comparable to, to we, we, we don't know what the capacities of these things will be because they don't exist yet. Um, we're anticipating it's going to be like SSDs because if if you look at what people are publishing in the literature, you can see that they're saying things like it's the density of NAND. Okay. Uh, well, I'm sorry, from, from a data center Okay, so the, 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 the hang, hang, hang on, I've got to repeat all this. Give, give me a second. All right, so <laughs> the, 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 the concern is that in the data center uh, with, 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 with big data that it's all going to be uh, too, ex it's going to be too expensive to keep everything local to this machine. And I, I, I think there's, there's definitely going to be some usages where this kind of stuff is just not appropriate. Um, in a corporate environment, data does not live on the server, data lives on the SAN. And the best you can do with persistent memory in that kind of environment is going to be cache, right through cache, of what's out on the SAN. Um, so yeah, uh, there's, there's definitely work needed to enhance um, things like Ceph and um, other you know, kind, kind of storage um, uh, file systems and so on. That um, you know, it's there's a lot of work to be done. I mean, I I <laughs> I, 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 I have some some it up on the slide. Like maybe a persistent page cache is the way to go. So when 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 you reboot everything that was in your page cache beforehand is still in your page cache. That that could be really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. It is. It is. It is critical. Critical for performance um, because um, there are. Uh, we've, we've talked to some people who do. Uh, who, who talk to customers, and, and the customers are saying, when we reboot or when we have unexpected downtime, it's not just that the machine is down. It's how long the machine takes to come back to a steady state where it's got all the stuff cached that it needs to have cached. And if they could only have a way to reload their cache quickly, they'd be much happier. And this does solve that customer problem. The flash operations are much quicker. Yeah, so sync is actually a problem, and I've only got two minutes left, uh, in fact, 90 seconds left of this talk. So <laughs> rather than getting into sync, does anyone else have a question? Yes, sir. Okay, so the question is hibernation. Is, is, is what we're working on here going to bring us back to a point where you just close your laptop, remove the power, plug, plug power back in at some point later, open the laptop up, and it's all just still there? Um, that isn't something we're looking at right now. Um, we, we still see um, a difference between this persistent memory and um, volatile memory. We still think there's a use for volatile memory in the computer system. Um, I think there could well be a use for doing faster hibernation. Um, but I don't think that we're going to get to a point where 
you just remove power and then you start the CPU again from the point that it left off. We, we, we think people probably are still going to have to reboot. But we, it, could, it, could, it could quite happily make for faster hibernation because you don't need to save those pages off to disk before you remove power, but you've still got to do the restore, restore state step. Um, anyone else? Yes, sir. Uh, how, how does this compare to the current transparent caching um, with PCI Express? Basically, we, we can use it for this. I mean, it's, it, we're, we're going to expose this stuff as a, as a block device, and you can use it just like a PCI Express uh, block device. It's just way quicker. So, for existing applications like databases which use ODA directly, it would be uh, possible for them to use uh, XIP even for normal devices. So, what I mean is, uh, is uh, XIP going to replace ODA? Uh, in some way? Is XIP going to replace ODirect? Um, XI, the XIP code um, does implement ODirect um, now, after the rewrite. Um, it, it, it basically all I/O is ODirect to this stuff. Um, but applications like databases that have chosen to use ODirect will still see the, um, will we'll see what they expect with ODirect, which is that it doesn't get cached in the page cache. It just goes straight through to media, which is what they want. Yeah, yeah. That's right. I'm out of time, I understand. So thank you all for coming.